brand new week on the Just Baseball Show, folks. Walker Bueller on college and cutters. I've got a closer question, and then we've got a whole bunch of pitchers that we want to hit on right now. Jack, Peter, Just Baseball Show presented by BetMGM. What can JB fans do for the people, Peter? Well, unfortunately, JB fans is no more. You lost your chance to wager $10 on any MLB money line and receive $200 in bonus bets. Thankfully, if you use code just baseball, risk free bet up to $1,000 when you put that code in there. Code just baseball. But again, gambling problem must call 1 800 or text. 1-800-GAMBLER, but there is a great code. Once you download, use code just baseball, and there's a risk-free bet up to $1,000, kind of whatever you deposit. Uh, so for the big bettors out there, might as well cash in, but even if you only want to deposit a couple of bucks, they'll match it, and it'll be a risk-free bet on the king of sportsbooks. Absolute no-brainer. Easy peasy, baby. Um, All right, we've got a whole bunch of stuff that we want to hit on. I think rapid fire and we can start with my closer question or end with it. I kind of want to start with it. Fair. But the thing is, it's called a closer question. So kind of like what does Felix Bautista come in the first inning? Maybe like opener type thing. Should we open with the closer question? (laughs) Yeah. Just we got to close with the closer question. You kidding me? Even pre-recording, we were talking about how we're going to do the show. And you're like, we'll end with the closer question. Now we're just going out of whack. No, fair. All right. We're going to open with your softball bitch fest. What's going on here? Thank you. And no, I mean, you could call it a bitch fest, but I think a lot of people would give me props. You know, I battled through a finger injury, right? I'm back on the diamond home run in my first at bat. Not even lying about that. Did lie uh, straight away center. Just a straight up piss missile, the, way all out. All the above. All the above. Just incredible bat speed, hand speed. Yeah. Props to me on that one. Yeah. But I'm pitching on the mound, and for some reason, I get a comebacker. And when I say for some reason, is my instinct was to stick my hand out there. Took one off the finger. It's definitely swollen for those people on um, YouTube. I mean, the camera isn't doing it justice. Just trust me, it really, really hurts. Yeah. Uh, so battled through it. Couldn't really grip a bat. Still went up to bat, hit a line drive to center. Did get out, but, you know, got claps in the dugout because battling through an injury like that in a sport as rigorous as slow pitch softball, it was impressive. Props to me. Yeah, so this is the second time that you have given yourself flowers about a softball injury. When did you last give yourself flowers? Um, I mean, the last time I played softball, I had to give myself props. You know, I mean, when you earn it, like, we're about to talk about Nathan Eovaldi. We keep talking about how we keep shoving, but we give props when it's due. If I keep performing, I deserve more props. So if you have a down week, I don't want you to hide, and I want oh, no. us to address it. I'm a stand-up guy. People know me. Humble. Honest. Yeah. Humble. Yeah. So I'm going to be humble, and I'm going to tell you when I have a bad day. Did I have a bad day today? You could call that by an injury, but... At the plate, on the mound, got the win for my team. Like, is unbelievable performance by me. Kind of, I pulled a Willis Reed, except okay. I couldn't even go back in the game because I couldn't really squeeze the bat. So, yeah. you're a little bit more like Lou Reed than Willis Reed. Um, but I don't understand the reference. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> um, yeah, it, and if there's one thing that I just learned about my friend Peter, it's that he's humble, and, humble. and it's very clear that he will tell you that. Absolutely, one of the most humble people out. Perfect. We can give Nate Yavaldi his flowers right now uh, because this guy is pitching out of his freaking mind. And and you look at the American League Cy Young race. We're going to get to another guy here very soon that I think should be in the thick of that AL Cy Young race here on uh, Monday, June 5th, when the AL Cy Young is not decided. Um, Sonny Gray obviously was the guy that jumped out here, right? He had a sub two. His ERA climbed over two on Saturday. Um, Yavaldi here should probably be considered one of the two or three Cy Young front runners at this moment. Nathan Yavaldi, 74 and a third. Uh, actually, this might be outdated. You got seven and two with the 242. What do you got in front of you? Yeah, why don't I just tell you what he's done over his past seven starts? He's six and oh, 52 and two thirds innings, 46 Ks, a 068 ERA, and a 068 whip. I even think it's doing him a slight disservice saying he's in the running for one of the best pitchers in the American League. I think he has been the best pitcher in the American League. And I always think that context matters right within a start. 
I thought that the Mariners were going to win that game against the Rangers. It was Bryce Miller against Nathan Eovaldi, and it had nothing to do with the Rangers. It was more on the fact that the Rangers just won 16 to 3. The Mariners were trying not to get swept. It's a division game. You kind of expect just, it's really hard to sweep a division rival, right? But Nate Eovaldi didn't give a shit about any of that. Shoved against this Mariners team, who have been hitting the ball hard, hasn't really been finding gaps lately. But if you look at how they performed in the last, I think, three weeks, number one in hard hit rate. Nathan Eovaldi didn't give a shit about that. He just continues and continues to shove. And then on the backs of it, you expect a Rangers team to kind of, you know, not show up for that game. Their offense, just historically, you put up 16 runs, kind of an outlier game. Sometimes the bats just come out slow because they scored all the runs the day before. This Rangers team is just built different. 12 to 3 win, smacking balls all over the ballpark. Remember when we said that we were worried about their outfield? Holy shit, was I wrong. Ezekiel Duran is a stud. Leody Tavares has been a beast. Adolis Garcia, I mean, enough said. Dude's leading the league in RBIs. I almost don't even group them in, even though all of them have been playing not all-star caliber baseball, but well above average, and Adolis Garcia has been an all-star level. And yeah. then, I mean, we could just talk about the rest of their team because they're all, they've are all they all been fantastic. We said it, Jack. They're a couple bullpen arms away from real World Series contention, but the thing is they don't even need a fucking bullpen because they're up by nine by the sixth inning. And Yavaldi has two complete games under his belt already. He's the only guy, like there are what, 12 other complete games. He's the only one with two. Um, Yavaldi at this point, as we were recording at 7.13 p.m. on Sunday, June 4th, Nate Yavaldi is sixth in ERA. He's one of two guys in baseball, along with Shane McClanahan, with eight wins. Yavaldi here is the leader among major league pitchers in innings pitched. He is the only guy over the 80 inning threshold. Garrett Coles and out away, Framber Valdez and Logan Weber, three outs away, but it's Yavaldi alone at the top and Yavaldi second in whip in Major League Baseball, only to Baltimore's Tyler Wells. Yavaldi has found it. And if I'm not mistaken, Yavaldi was the American League Pitcher of the Month in May. Michael Walker was the National League Pitcher of the Month in May. Don't worry, I already sent this to Colby. Um, but. Sorry, Red Pretty Sox interesting fans. that you've got two 2022 Boston Red Sox that are finding rejuvenation while Chris Sale, one of my favorite pitchers of all time, I'm not shitting on him, while Chris Sale hits the shelf with a, a shoulder issue here. Like, it sucks. And I'm watching Corey Kluber pitch the sixth inning while the Red Sox are down by two. I mean, it's incredible. And I'm not trying to have the Red Sox catch a stray. All I'm saying is these guys were – not damaged goods, but subdued versions of themselves. I'm not buying the, you know, renaissance from Michael Waka. I think Michael Waka is good. He was good last year. I'm buying the rejuvenation of Nate Yavaldi. Absolutely. You have to buy the rejuvenation because the the off speed is, is, is looking as good as I've ever seen it. And it's his command too. Like he doesn't walk anybody. Yeah. I mean, it's just strikes and he's filling up the zone and it's one thing to have, like, we talk about the difference between control and command. Control is really referencing, can you throw strikes at all, right? How's your control? Are you throwing balls or strikes? But then when we talk about command, it's command within the strike zone. That's what makes Shane Bieber still unhittable. I know he's had some tough outings, but when Shane Bieber is at his absolute best, he's only throwing 90, 91 miles an hour, but the catcher's glove ain't moving. Like, it's right exactly where he wants that ball. Right. Same thing right now for Nathan Eovaldi. That's what, what, what's what been so impressive for him. And Red Sox fans, I hope you don't take it to heart. We're more making fun of our guy Colby because he is delusional. And every single time we go at him, he's like, this is all part of Heim's plan. So I guess Heim's plan was to get Kluber instead of Eovaldi and Michael Waka, which were all around the same AAV. But we're also saying that they shouldn't have let this guy walk, right? Because you replace one aging right-hander with a couple other shittier aging right-handers, right? You remember when they did the Corey Kluber deal, I was like, I just saw him. That's not a pitcher you give $10 million. That's not a pitcher you give $1 million no, to. And like, Uvalde got cooked. what? Uvalde got 31 over two years? Didn't he get? No, I think he got 16 per year, two years, 34 or 32, but it's 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 in the low 30s on a two-year deal. 
I'll tell you right now, Nate Yavaldi got a two-year, $34 million deal and a vesting option in 25. He's 33 years old. This is one of the older 33-year-olds in baseball. I know. It, he's does been around. Seem, it does seem like he's been around for two decades now. But, I mean, he's obviously found it. And mm-hmm. guys like that, like, he knows how to pitch. And this is an incredible run. And the Rangers are on an incredible run. I mean, just turning on Rangers games. Like, I talked about the Diamondbacks being probably my favorite team to watch in the National League right now. How can you not say it's the Texas Rangers in the American League? They might be over the Na- over the Arizona Diamondbacks. Because every single dude in their lineup, you've got Travis Jankowski robbing home runs. Yeah. I, it's Semyon is unconscious. Seager looks like one of the best shortstops in Major League Baseball. I could just con- Jonah Heim. I could just keep talking about this right. team. We could do a whole podcast on them, but we got other teams to talk about. I feel like we do a whole pod on them every time. Um, it's, it's so much fun, it, and it's so cool. I bet Rangers fans like they turn on the TV. They know their team's going to put up ten. It's it's got to be an unbelievable time to watch Ranger baseball right now. Right. So you mentioned the level of fun with Ranger games. You also just teased the level of fun with Diamondback games. And I think what this weekend told you um, with Arizona hosting Atlanta is that Arizona's no joke, man. Like they can nope. win series in October if they do get there it's a really long season but this version of the Arizona Diamondbacks absolutely hung with this version of the Atlanta Braves now what I will say here is we got to watch AJ Smith Shaver debut a couple of debuts uh this weekend Jordan Walker obviously recalled we'll talk a little bit more about that uh on tomorrow's show with Aram but uh Luke and Baker got selected by the Cardinals former Gator awesome. National Player of the Year um, so shout out Luke and Baker. This guy was hitting the shit out of the ball in AAA. But the one that I want to hit on for a moment is AJ Smith Shaver, who I know has been brought up on this podcast recently, has been brought up a lot on the call up. He's a Braves right hander. He's a starting pitcher in the minor leagues, drafted in the seventh round out of high school in 2021 at a Colleyville Heritage High School. So he was high school teammates with Bobby Witt Jr., by the way. But really Smith cool. Shaver, yeah. Smith Shaver was a guy that has climbed at a pace that is absolutely freaking ridiculous. Smith Shaver last year, 17 starts with Loe Augusta. This year, and he is 20 years old, three starts in high A, 14 innings, no runs, 23 Ks, four walks. Okay. Two starts in double A, seven innings, five hits, no runs. Okay. Two starts in triple A with Gwinnett. 12 innings, four earned, that's a three ERA, 13 Ks, five walks. So overall, in his seven starts, three in high A, two in double, two in triple, you're looking at a guy that has a 109 ERA, punching out 12 and a half and walking three and a half. He's 20 years old. He just climbed three levels in two months. What does Alex Anthopoulos do? He puts him in the bullpen. He threw two innings of relief with the Braves down. And he went six up, six down. This motherfucker sat 95 with his fastball. He topped it 97, and he was snapping sliders left and right. It was against the top of that Diamondbacks lineup, who was previously rolling. They really got to Mike Soroka, and he came in and just kind of shut them down. Of course, Colin McHugh was was the pitcher before Smith Schauber. But, yeah, I mean, I was watching that game, and I was because I had the over, right? And it's it's uh, five to three, and I need over eight and a half. And I'm like, oh, perfect. Smith Shaver's in for the over because it's a 20 year old. He's it's a rookie been on the road. Accelerated across. The Dimebacks offense was rolling. And then I'm like, oh, shit. The first yeah. fastball with that rise to it. The yeah. slider. I'm like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I might be screwed here. Thankfully, the Braves did it against Andrew Chafin. But if he had stayed in for the rest of the game, like I was screwed because the stuff looked really good. And it's a rookie making his debut on the road. We saw Brian Wu for the Seattle Mariners really struggle, of course, against this juggernaut Texas Rangers team. I almost, I, I give him a full break. Like they are just unconscious right now. It doesn't matter who's pitching. And even they won in low scoring games against Luis Castillo and John Gray. And John Gray shot down. The, I mean, they're just incredible. But going back to the Smith Shaver thing, the balls on this kid, I mean, through every level. And the reason why you tend to see me fade rookie pitchers on the road is because they start to nibble, right? You can have trust in your stuff in the lower levels of the minor leagues. Let's see you do it on the road when there are nerves there. 
filling up the strike zone with quality stuff at 20 years old against a Diamondbacks team. That's why context is so important. Diamondbacks were rolling. They crushed Mike Soroka. Yeah. They've yeah. been a good offense over the past couple of weeks. One of the best against right-handed pitching in particular came in and shut the door and kept the Braves in it. Right now, I mean, as we're recording, it the Braves just took the lead. Now it's 8-5. Yeah. Now it's 8-5. Like, he was a big reason of holding that lead. Now the Braves win, and it's just another guy. It's so impressive. Yeah. So Smith Schauber is great, and when they need a start, uh, he can absolutely give them that start. Lightning quick. Tristan McKenzie made his season debut. He went, what, five innings, one hit, 10, 10 Ks. Ks. Unconscious. Yeah. I saw McKenzie make a rehab, and he did not look that sharp. So this guy might have just been gearing up, and now he's all the way back. Corresponding move was DFA Zach Plesak. Interesting. I don't see this guy clearing waivers. I think that somebody gives him a big league shot. Uh, conversation's not about Plesak. It's about Tristan McKenzie. And McKenzie is the shot in the ass that Cleveland needed. And it was so funny because Joe Ryan pitched incredible that game against that was McKenzie. A duel. Yeah, duel. that was insane. I mean, it's 0 0 going into the seventh inning. I think Joe Ryan up to that point had what, one hit? I think he was yeah. six innings, one hit, four Ks, and McKenzie's on the other side. Five innings, one hit, 10 Ks. So absolute but, pitching duel. And the Guardians ended up winning that game. Like that's so important for the Guardians. If they get him back just to shut down opposing offenses, because the Guardians are still not scoring anything. Like they almost wasted that game from Tristan McKenzie, but they ended up with the win. They needed it. And McKenzie's curveball looked all the way back. The fastball command was all the way there. On the road, returning from the IL, you don't know ever what to expect. It could be the best pitcher on planet Earth. You're working your way back from an injury. He put all those concerns to bed and looked like what we think could be a potential ace in this league. And this is the type of guardian game that you love, right? McKenzie, five innings, one hit, no runs, 10 Ks. James Karinchak throws the sixth. An inning, no runs, two Ks. Trevor Steffen throws the seventh. Inning, no runs, two Ks. Eniel De Los Santos throws the eighth. He allows Who's a run. also, like, he deserves the eighth inning role. That dude yes. is fucking nuts. No, he's great. And, like, a run came in against him in this inning, and his ERA yeah. is still under two. Yeah. And then you got Class A closing it down for his 19th save of the year. The problem is the Guardians won this game 2-1. And I understand that's that the line is here, but that's a whole nother thing that frustrates the crap out of me. You get an outing like this from the staff as a collective in their nine innings. Five hits, a run, 16 Ks, two walks. You win that game by one? We serious? You know who they need? A bat? Yes. I would pick up the phone and call Rick Hahn or whoever's working the phones Tim over there Anderson? in Chicago. No, and go get Eloy Jimenez. Go get that big bat in the outfield. Because he's a contact guy. Like he's not, he's not a huge swing and miss guy. He would fit the Guardians mold of no matter what you are, you can't strike out over 25% and we don't want you. You could be freaking, you know, the greatest hitter on planet Earth, but if you strike out 26%, like, they probably hate Matt Olson for some reason. Yeah. Their models probably hate him. They could use a guy like Eloy, and with less and less games between the divisions, I could see them potentially go get an Eloy. That's a perfect bat for them. They Except call... he played 30 games for them. Right. They should call Dana Brown and see if Jordan Alvarez is available. I think that yes. guy would be a perfect bat for them. Strikes out too much. And I, <laughs> sub 20, but yeah, yeah you're right. It's not sub 10. Yeah, no, it's not sub 10. It's not Steven Quad. Yeah, fair. Okay. Um, Two Astros pitchers that we want to hit on real quick. Houston and the Angels matched up again. I've got Fromber Valdez and Christian Javier on the docket. Let's start with Fromber because I mentioned Yavaldi should be in the top two or three in terms of AL Cy Young love. I think Sonny Gray is probably three. Yavaldi and Fromber are 1A, 1B right now. And Fromber Valdez continues to be a beast. He's what second in all of baseball or third in all of baseball behind Yavaldi and Cole in innings pitched. And Fromber Valdez at this point is doing something that is ridiculous against teams with a record over or at 500. Framber Valdez has started six games. He's got a sub two ERA in those games. He shows up for the big ones. He has matched up mano a mano with Shohei Otani twice, one of which came on Friday. And in those two games matched up against Shohei Otani, Framber Valdez has gone 15 innings, eight in one, seven in the other, 15 innings, one run, 19 Ks, one walk. 
His best stuff is against the best fucking player on the planet. The nuts on that motherfucker. Talk about like, Smith Shaver coming in with those nuts. Framber's nuts are like maybe hurting him. Like if his nuts were a little bit smaller, it's probably dragging him down. He'd probably have a 1-5 ERA because his nuts are so damn big. No, it's so funny with Framber. Um, you know, I'm a part of gambling Twitter. A lot of people, you know, are, um, you know, maybe not a lot of people are watching for it. No, go ahead. No, the first step to the first step to acknowledging it is admitting it. Yeah, is admitting it. <laughs> I don't know how many people are actually turning on the TV to watch for Amber starts because a lot of people on gam- gambling Twitter look at a 3.86 expected ERA, right? Look at some of the peripherals and be like, oh, he's due for regression. He's due for regression. They say the same thing about Bryce Elder. Bryce Elder is in another category because he doesn't just get balls drilled onto the ground at the same rate as Framber does. The bubbles like, are blue. The bubbles are blue. No, it's so funny because they're like, well, he's in the fifth percentile of average exit velocity. Framber is. He's in the 12th percentile of hard hit rate, right? He's got a 3.86 expected ERA. But go through year over year. This is a guy who continually outperforms the peripherals because you can't hit the ball in the air. It might be hard, right? He's throwing 97 mile an hour sinkers. It might be hard. Like those ground balls are hard, but they're getting turned into double plays. I mean, he just gets out of anything. That's the thing. It, I, okay. It's one Oh two off the bat. If it's one Oh two on the ground to pain you, I don't care. It doesn't matter. That's what I'm saying. Like this is, these are, Framber is the perfect example of a guy where I don't give a fuck about the peripherals. I don't because he has proved year over year. I mean, we could go through it. I don't want to just list numbers, but if you go to baseball savant and look at Framber Valdez's profile, it's a high two ZRA and it's a high threes XCRA. It does not matter. This guy is masterful. Absolutely masterful. He is the definition of, of a ground ball pitcher. When you go on Google and search ground ball pitcher, a picture of Framber's nuts are going to be on the screen. Well, no, that's a private browser. If you search ground ball pitcher, yeah, um, maybe I have a different internet thing. <laughs> it's Valdez and Logan Webb. Like those are the two. And like you Webb, look, yes, but it's Framber's but Framber on another level. Degree. But Logan Webb, again, another great performance against the Baltimore Orioles who crush right. He's like, He, again, shoved. He just continues to do it. You're in and you're out. These are high two ZRA guys. You're in, you're out. And they the pitch counts are low, so they go seven every time. These are perfect pitchers. That's that's the thing, man. And, like, these are my favorite guys to watch. Um, It's the ones that don't have the overwhelming stuff, like a Sonny Gray, like a Kyle Hendricks when Kyle was at the peak of his powers. Um, Like, those were my favorite. Kyle Hendricks had overwhelming stuff? No, no, no. That don't oh, yeah. have overwhelming stuff. Oh, Sonny yeah, yeah, doesn't yeah. have overwhelming stuff. No, no. Yeah. I, 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 you were listing Sonny Gray than Kyle Hendricks. I'm like, do we have the same definition of overwhelming stuff? No, no, no. <laughs> I'm saying like the guys that don't, but yeah. also the guys that do one thing incredibly well and you will not beat them. Kenley Jansen has 400 saves with a cutter. Mariano Rivera is the greatest closer of all time with a cutter. Like those guys are fascinating to me. And I think Fromber and Logan Webb are cut from a similar cloth. Like I'm going to get you to hit the ball on the ground. I Brian dare you. Else. I dare you. You know what's coming. Framber's got a couple of pitches, right? When we look at Framber's usage, he throws his sinker 49% of the time, his curveball 25% of the time. So three out of every four pitches you're going to see from Framber Valdez are the sinker or the curveball. He mixes in the cutter to both righties and lefties, and he throws his changeup. He actually hasn't thrown a single changeup this year to left-handed batters. He doesn't face that many lefties, because why would you put in a lefty? It's a death sentence against Framber. 118 changeups to righties. So he is throwing more pitches this year. Like, he's up the changeup usage. He's up the cutter usage. But it's still mostly just sinker curveball. And it's, I dare you to hit it, and you just can't. It's ground balls. Yeah, granted, are they hard ground balls? Sure, because you know what's coming. And that's what makes those individual pitches that much more impressive because generally you know what's coming and you know the location of the pitches too because if you look at some heat maps with Framber, they're in the same spot. And it's funny, the reddest spot for his sinker is right down the middle. Yep, yep. But the thing is, like, the pitch... Yeah, the pitch profile allows the ball. Starting up here. It's starting at the top of the zone and ending middle. Exactly. So I just want to say minimum of 350 batted ball events last year. Like, this is pretty much qualified starters, I guess, a little bit lower than that. Um, When you look at average launch angle against, Logan Webb has the third lowest at 3.1 degrees. 
Alex Cobb was second at 1.8. He's been awesome. 1.8. There was one qualified starter with an average launch angle in the negatives. Framber Valdez had a negative 3.6 degree launch angle. Like he is the best by a very wide margin. That's what I'm saying. Yes. You found a quirk in Christian Javier. Dude, (laughs) this is hilarious. Angels fans know this very well, as do Astros fans. And maybe this is, you know, commonly known, but I saw it really in action over this weekend. And I just burst out laughing. Christian Javier owns Mike Trout. Remember when I was talking about the blue zones for Trout, how the up and away fastball is just the fastballs up. It's always kind of been his a little bit of a kryptonite. Javier does it every time and he can't touch shit. Christian Javier gets Mike Trout. Mike Trout is 0 for 12 with eight strikeouts. And there was in a bat. It started off the game. And Christian Javier is not locating his fastball. I'm pretty sure it went up to 3-0 or it was at least 2-0. It's a hitter's count. Christian Javier goes fastball up, Trout swings and misses. Javier throws a fastball right down the dick at 92 miles an hour, right down the middle. Mike Trout made contact, hit a weak fly ball to center field. And I'm like, if he can't hit that, and then the guys in the booth are talking about this, and I was like, all right, let's watch his next at bat. Strikeout. And was down in the count early on. Javier's, Javier it's it's almost incredible the way he pitches sometimes he gets down in the count it's like 2-0 or 3-0 he throws a fastball right down the middle to get back in the count then it's just a fastball up and guys just can't hit it Javier's been struggling a little bit more this year because of that he's getting down in counts the command early in the counts like the Rays they're very particular I was listening to Pete Fairbanks talk about it throw strike one every time that should be your main goal. Throw strike one and then figure it out later. Because these teams, they know that batting average, you know, all that kind of stuff drops down if you get ahead in the count. So that's been Javier's issue this year. He's not getting ahead in counts. But the stuff is still so damn good that he battles back and still gets that weak contact, can still get that strikeout. But even going down in the count to a guy like Mike Trout, who knows a fastball is coming, can't hit it. So... I think I wrote an article last year of, of pitchers that own hitters and hitters that own pitchers. But watching Javier own Mike Trout of all people, one of the top 10 players of all time, or at least he's going to go down that way, yeah. is just hilarious. Because what can't Trout do? Hit the high fastball. What does Javier do? Throw him high fastballs? And he's like, I dare you. I dare you. Yeah. I, so I, funny. I wonder if Trout would say like if somebody asked who's the one hitter you, or who's the one pitcher you just can't figure out it's mike trout like I, is there another pitcher in major league baseball that he can't figure out we'd have to probably do a dive and maybe there is but the level of domination the in the head of mike trout like christian javier owns a full ass condo in his head but that that's the thing i'm wondering if you asked mike trout like sat him down one on one who's the one guy that makes you the most uncomfortable do you think his answer is javier i think yes has to be has to be i bet he thinks javier is the fucking grim reaper yeah <laughs> over 12 with eight strikeouts especially, against mike trout especially in that astros uniform too definitely yeah. like merchant of death um <laughs> literally all right g rod what do yeah. you know about grayson rodriguez who's currently a norfolk tide so This is mainly for Orioles fans to not give up on a guy like Grayson because when Grayson came up, he really, really struggled. I'm just pulling up his stats right now to um, give fans of other teams because Orioles fans know that he really struggled. And he posted a 7.35 ERA yeah, with a 53% hard hit rate, which puts him near the top of Major League Baseball in a bad way. 53% of the balls hit off Grayson Rodriguez were 95 miles an hour or above. It's really, really bad. And I think all of us at just baseball and throughout the league were shocked to see him struggle so mightily. And this is directly from Eno Saris, who is a phenomenal baseball mind, covers, you know, a bunch of different shit, big in fantasy baseball for the athletic. And Eno Saris said that other teams using Hawkeye, which is a baseball software system. I honestly don't know that much about Hawkeye. Maybe you can fill in the holes there. Um, But what they were doing, other teams were tracking his pitches. And it was through limb tracking. 
they basically Grayson was tipping his pitches that from the second start on, there was something with his release point that hitters picked up on that using this technology, they knew what Grayson was throwing, which I was just like, damn, man, you, you get up and you get called to the big leagues. And from your second start on, they know what's coming. I mean, that's a death sentence. So he's down in Norfolk. He's figuring some stuff out. But Orioles fans, we cannot give up on this guy. And I don't want to put it all in, but I'm willing to say, like, I'm not putting much stock into these struggles at all. If they know what's coming, major league hitters can hit anybody using this technology. Just, I was blown away by that information from Eno Saris. Yeah, so I guess I just have a bunch of immediate follow-ups to it, and I know that like you may not know the answers to them. I don't even know if like Eno would know the answers to them. Yeah, it this, is, just be... this is new information. Once we get more information, we'll fill in the holes. Just wanted to put that out there because I heard it, and it's coming from a very credible source who heard from Orioles brass. So it's like, right. okay, this this is real. So Hawkeye, if you haven't heard of Hawkeye, I wonder if you've ever heard of Trackman. Um, yeah, of course. Yeah, so a lot of a lot of baseball fans have heard of TrackMan, right? It, especially the new age. Like TrackMan was almost the way to grab pitch speed without a radar gun, and that helps with you know IDing, positioning, and all that stuff. Yeah, Hawkeye the shape takes, of the pitches, the yeah. you know the spin rates, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, all the new and, stuff that came in from Statcast, and, and it's high speed cameras. And Hawkeye is almost an enhanced version of that. Hawkeye and TrackMan are kind of um, they work off of each other or like they kind of did the same thing. Hawkeye, here's how they describe it on hawkeyeinnovations.com. Our synchronized multi-angle re replay technology, of course, SMART is the abbreviation, works as the basis for our video capture, review, clipping, and distribution capabilities. The track systems are optical tracking and camera calibration technologies used for performance tracking, ball tracking, and object tracking purposes. Insight is our suite of technologies that provide data collation, storage, aggregation, delivery, and visualization capabilities. So when you see the stick figures, um, Petriello tweets this out a lot. You ever seen the stick figures like this for the YouTube crowd? Yeah. When you see the stick figures simulate, you know, going after a ball defensively or swinging and watching the ball flight, that's Hawkeye. Hawkeye is a bunch of high-speed cameras placed around a ballpark. Every AAA ballpark has it. Every Major League ballpark has it. And that will help ID pitch shape, pitch speed, spin, ball, like exit velocity, distance of travel baseball. Um, outfield feet, jump. Upper, yeah, like, outfield yeah, jump. like how outfielders are getting those jumps. Every savant average. bubble you see is from Hawkeye. Yep. Now, Hawkeye. And TrackMan. Yes, and TrackMan. Yeah. So all of this is accessible for every major league team and every minor league team. My my natural follow-up question to that is he's obviously not tipping pitches in real time. Like you can't crack the code and because of this simulation, you know what he's throwing. Because like that's cheating with tech, which is illegal. Yep. Tipping pitches and noticing and being receptive to tipped that's pitches is edge. not illegal. No, nope. I don't think it's any tipping pitches going on. When I hear that, my mind with this is strictly guesswork. When I hear what Eno said, when I hear what you relay to me, I think this guy may have a tunneling problem or a lack of tunneling. Yep. And I think that his arm that, slot. I think the different pitches that he throws, right? Like what makes Devin Williams change up so unhittable? Yes, it's the incredible amount of horizontal and vertical movement but it's coming from the same arm slot. You can't yes. tell whether it's a fastball or it's a changeup. Like I generally think when I look at Grayson's pitch mix with the four seam, the changeup, the slider and the cutter, he might not be doing a very good job of throwing it from the same release point. Right. So it's arm slot and arm speed. So they may know if he's coming from a certain click, like tick on the clock, right? If he's throwing his curveball at 11 o'clock, and he's throwing his fastball at 10 o'clock and his slider at nine o'clock or, you know, something in between there, they may know. He may also have a different spot for his glove hand for each of these pitches. You so saw that with Kopech against the Giants when it was a home run derby. Exactly. So my thought is 
this guy may not be a great tunneler just yet. He may be doing something different on each pitch. And they were able to figure that out through film and through Hawkeye, through these simulations. So that's all I take from that. Yeah. I, I, once we find out more information about exactly what it was, we will, of course, relay, relay that here on the Just Baseball Show. I just wanted to put it in Orioles fans' minds. Do not, under any circumstances, give up on this young phenom. He's got some stuff to figure out, but there's no debating that the stuff is still incredible, and he's still so young. He's 23 years old. He's a year older than Paul Skeens over there at LSU, who just threw 124 pitches against Tulane. I mean, what is LSU doing? <laughs> 